This is data be characterized by uh, this is a quote from Pauli, which is say that, that our programs are not only not right, but they're not even wrong. Okay, wrong would be progress. So what I mean here is, is that, so a program to me is an answer to a question. And I don't really understand what the question is, that I can't even, I can't even be wrong. If I really knew what the question was, at least I could be wrong. And from there I could make progress toward being right. Okay. But so, the, so I, I think programming as it's commonly practiced, we're missing the most important part, which is what is the question? And so how do I know when the answer is right? And why does it matter? Can't we just be kind of, yeah, you know, I basically know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to build this thing that makes animation or something like that. And I would say no, because there's, there's something about precision, which is we don't know what we don't know. And this is how Bertrand Russell said it. Bertrand Russell dedicated a lot of his life to, uh, to getting really clear about what the questions are. Um, and he, so he says this, everything is vague to a degree you do not realize till you have tried to make it precise. Now, Russell spent a lot of his life working on making questions precise, and he was a little underappreciated uh, at the time, so uh, he's, he's really speaking from experience and insight here. And then there's another dynamic, which is it's a psychological one, and, and this is uh, this quote is a good way to sum it up, which is what we wish we readily believe. So when we're programming, I want my program to be correct, right? That's my goal. I wish that my program were already correct, Okay, so what does that mean? It means that I'm going to be easily duped into believing it's already correct. Okay, now what enables me to be duped? A lack of precision. It's because exactly what Russell says here. I'm not even aware of how vague my reasoning is, and therefore where the uh, flaws in it lie, until I've had to make it precise. Okay, so this is my pitch for, uh, for precise abstraction. So, my goal in library design is always this. I want to have a precise, elegant, reusable abstraction. And how do we do that? Well, I want to find the best practices I can. So who in this world, who in our history, has, has really worked on precise, elegant, reusable abstractions? Well, I'll give you a hint, it's not programmers. For one thing, we've only been around for a few decades, 60 years, 70 years, but there are some folks who've been working on this issue really concentrated at very high standards for much longer than that, and they're the mathematicians. So our job is to make precise, elegant, reusable abstractions. We want to look at mathematicians. And in particular, it's this field of abstract algebra, because that's really all about gathering patterns, reusable abstractions, and applying them over and over in interesting ways, and getting it right. In other words, the rigor gets the rigor forces them to get it right, and then their uh, and then the aesthetic is to uh, make it as elegant as possible. And in particular, in algebra, there's this notion of homomorphism. Maybe a scary word, but it's just, it's just a word from another language. It means it preserves a shape. There's something about a shape that's getting preserved. I'm going to show you many examples. And so don't be scared off by this word homomorphism. I'm going to give you a lot of concrete examples. So, how does this play out in Haskell? And I would say there, 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 there are you know, a variety of, of uh, mechanisms, but these three in particular. We have some standard type classes. Those type classes capture these mathematical abstractions. And the type classes have laws associated with them. Okay? So the law of body, that, that's what, uh, uh, that's what uh, gives them meaning independent of a particular implementation, for instance. And then there's this discipline that I've been exploring for years uh, that I call semantic type class morphisms. And I'll show you many examples of that. So if we use these three things, we can, in, uh, in a uh, purely functional, in uh, particular in a typed uh, language, do um, design really solid programs, well prep programs. So, we throw around the word functional a lot, functional programs, functional programming languages, and so on. Um, but it's one of these things that, as Russell said, um, I don't think we realize how vague that term is as a community. Um, so Peter Landon offered to get, this was in 1966, he wrote a seminal paper called The Next 700 Programming Languages. I highly recommend this paper. This paper is the grandfather of Haskell, Scheme, ML, uh, many of our modern thinking about um, programming, and particularly the idea of a domain-specific embedded language, all came out of this paper. In this paper, uh, Landon pointed out, again, in 1966, that the terms functional and, and declarative really lack precise meaning. So if we want to get clear uh, about these things, we better pick something else. We either better sharpen up the definition of them or use a different word. He suggested, this is a bad thing, just leave these terms behind. Uh, and he suggested the word denotative. Denotative 
he defines exactly what it means, and, and you can find it in the paper, but it's essentially these three properties. It's a language in which syntactically we use an ex a nested expression structure. Okay? So that, that's sort of what the service level is, a syntax, syntax kind of um, a characteristic. But here we go, we get into the depth of things, which is that every expression means something. It doesn't just mean something, we know what it means. It means something specific or precise. And not only that, but for an expression, the meaning of an expression depends only on the meanings of the components of the expression. It doesn't depend on what temperature it is or what color or hair your grandmother has today or something like that. Um, and that sounds ridiculous, but most programming languages violate this very principle, particularly ones with side effects. Okay, so, so this is what it means to be a, a denotative. <clears throat> and then he suggests that, that, that these principles, particularly this third one, gives us a test for whether a notation is genuinely functional or merely masquerading. Okay, so it's easy to be fooled. And, um, and one of the ways that we are fooled is in Haskell with this high new type. So this is a very important distinction. Functional, is fun Haskell's purely functional. Is IO functional? He'll say, yeah, 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 because it doesn't actually do anything. Okay, so yes, it's functional, and this only because functional doesn't have a precise meaning. It's just kind of a vague umbrella term. It's not denotative. We don't know what it means in a precise way. Um, and because of that, IO is not part of, it is not a part of Haskell that's good for equation reasoning. So it's a really important distinction. It's gotten blurred um, since one out of IO. Okay, so that's denotative programming. What's denotational design? So it's a design methodology that's particularly well suited for genuinely functional or denotative programming. Okay? It's something that, because we have in our language, has in particular, it's so strong at denotative programming, we can apply this, uh, this uh, paradigm uh, to great benefit. And here are some uh, properties. I'm just going to skim through them. I'll, I'll repeat this slide at the end. It will be more to you. So uh, this methodology, so it, it, it includes precise, simple, and compelling specifications. These are specifications your independent implementation. Okay? So the specifications inform the use and the implementation, but they don't entangle the two. It, it, it relates to standard algebraic abstractions. That's good for a variety of reasons. One way, one um, benefit of using standard abstractions is it, is it guides me toward tasteful design, powerful design, maybe in ways that I can't even predict. Also works well with our ecosystem. We have a lot of support for these abstractions. If I use these abstractions, I get to use that support in my data type for free. This next point is very important. Free of abstraction leaks. Okay. So is your library free of abstraction leaks? That's a fuzzy question. Who knows? But in this, this uh, approach, I'll make that question very precise and give them this methodology that uh, satisfies it. And then uh, if we're using classes, we want laws to be satisfied. We don't have to approve the laws. They're definite, you know, they're guaranteed to be, uh, to hold. And then finally, we can make correct implementations in the principle way based on specification, so correct by construction. All right, so that's the promise. So you have time. Oh dear, I forgot to start my time. Tell me what time it is, and then I'll adjust here. Uh, yeah, 50 minutes. 50? Yeah, okay. Okay, so as a first example, I'll give you um, uh, about a library for linear transformations. And so you could think of these matrices. Linear transformations is an abstract notion of matrix is a, is a sort of representation notion. So that's why I'm calling it linear transformations. So here's the assignment. Make a library. Uh, it's going to support linear transformations. We're going to need some representation because we're going to actually run it, store it, and compute it, and so on. And then, uh, and then in that library, two of these want to implement our identity and composition. Okay. So when I say, I know what that means, I'll just go ahead. But how will you know that it's right? Let's get precise about the question. And the question is, we're not even wrong. So here's the plan. This plan holds for, for library design in general. I'm going to illustrate this plan through uh, the example of linear transformations. So I wanted to find the interface, the abstract interface. Okay. And then the denotation. And so this is the most important thing. This is what every, this is what it all means. I don't know what it means. I don't really care how it's implemented. It's answering a question, and I don't understand the question. Okay, so define the interface and the meaning of that interface. And then we can give a representation. In fact, we can give a variety of representations. So at this point, we, get, we can consider radically different ways to, uh, to implement the interface, every one of which is, uh, respects the denotation. 
Okay, so the third step is pick a representation, and the fourth is calculated implementation. I mean, the calculated is derive, uh, uh, derive an implementation using a process uh, uh, by which it's guaranteed to be correct. In other words, it follows from the specification. Okay, so first example. Um, uh, so we have a type here. So this is going to be a two parameter type. Now, this funny symbol here, this means a representation of a linear transformation. Okay, I'm going to say map. Or mess up without saying the transformation over and over. So there's a representation of a linear map. It has an input and output. So those are the two arguments. Uh, if, if this uh, uh, notation is a little weird to you, I'm giving the kind uh, of, of this uh, constructor. So it's a linear map representation. It has two arguments. That's the first two stars. Uh, so they're both types and the results type. And now what are its operations? Well, first we're going to have just these three operations. We'll have more in a bit. So the first is, is to scale. So given a scalar value s, okay, scale takes s and it gives me a linear transformation from s to s. So it's a one-dimensional linear transformation. That's very simple. And then we'll have the identity and we'll have composition. Okay, we're not going to make very interesting linear transformations yet, but we'll make those in a, in a few more slides by adding uh, two more operations. Okay, so that's the interface. But so far, I just I haven't told you anything about what it means. So you could see could trivially satisfy this uh, interface, just write random code that has these types. Okay, but now we want it to mean something. There's a reason I'm calling it linear maps. So we give a model. So the model is the mathematical meaning. So here I'm talking about using a slightly different notation. They look similar on purpose, but I wanted you to be able to visually distinguish. The top one is, is a data type, it's in a program, and, uh, and the second one without the code is the mathematical notion of a linear transformation. So it's a linear subset of functions from A to B. So linear, if you know what it means for a function to be linear, is that uh, it means that if you uh, apply a function f to a scaled argument, you get a scaling of f applied to the argument. Okay, so uh, uh, f of s of x, f of s times x equals s times f of x. Okay, that's one of the other properties that it distributes over addition. So uh, f plus g, that transformation of x equals f of x plus g of x. Okay, that's just what linear means. And we want to model all of those functions. Okay, so here's the specification. The specification relates the data type in my program to the mathematical operation, the mathematical model. So I have to define this function mu, and mu transforms, exactly, it maps from something in my program to something in this mathematical world. So, I have uh, these three operations so far, I have to say what they mean. So here's what I do. I say the meaning of scale of s is, well, it's going to be this function, lambda x, s times x. And that function is linear. Okay, so what is the meaning of my id hat function? Well, I call it id hat because it's going to mean the identity. It's the identity of linear transformation. And similarly, this g compose hat f, what is the its meaning? Well, it's going to be the composition as linear functions of the meanings of the arguments. So this is critical. If anybody's confused at this point, please ask questions. The process multiplication. Uh, the process multiplication. I just, uh, this Haskell code that I ran through my type set in certain modifications. Okay. So, we have the Haskell data type, we have the mathematical domain, the idea is we know what the mathematical domain is, we know what scaling, identity, uh, composition, and some other thing operations mean there. How do we define operations on our data type that's consistent, that implements correctly this mathematical abstraction? That's the idea. If we can do that, we win. And I know what it means for my program to be right. So it's not only, <laughs> it's, it's not not even wrong, it's not wrong, it's right actually. So that's, that's pretty good. All right, so representation. Now let's look at some possible representations. There are lots of, lots of choices here. I'm gonna pick one. So part of the specification says the meaning of scale S. And remember, so scale is, is an operation in our API. And I haven't told you how that it's gonna be implemented yet. So we're gonna figure out how to implement it. So let's try the first representation, which is I'm gonna do a GADT. And that GADT so far will have one constructor. I'm gonna do more later. So I'm going to say, I'm going to represent this type as a GADT. It's going to have one constructor called scale with a capital S, okay? 
and that scale has in it just, um, oh, I thought there was something here. I should say, it here, okay. um, I'll fix it now. This should say S to linear transformation, where a scale takes a, an S here. So that was a little boo boo. You see it used here. Okay, so what is the meaning? Now, now that I've defined a representation, I can find a function from that representation to actual mathematical linear transformations. Linear maps. And here it is. The meaning of, well, there's only one constructor, so that's all I have to define mu on so far. So what is the mu of scale? Well, it's gonna be just uh, what we said we mean by scale. Okay, so this is how I change, uh, I transform. I take the meaning of this uh, representation as a mathematical function. Now understand, this isn't a piece of code in my program that I'm going to run. This is me defining what my code means, and therefore what it means for it to be correct. It's giving me, uh, tell me what, what my job is in the And now, if I want to satisfy this specification, given this representation and this semantic function, then it's trivial. I define scale, that's my API, to be capital scale, that's my representation. Now this is really trivial, and if you're sort of wondering, what the heck's the point? I don't blame you, this is really as trivial. But it's because I played a wild card here. I get to decide the representation, and I get to decide the semantic function. So I decided in such a way to make this part of my job trivial, trivially easy. Okay? But I can only play that card once. So I have to figure out how to implement uh, identity and